I'm Don Holden at the Art Students League of New York. I'm standing in the studio where Robert Beverly Hale gave his famous lectures on figure drawing and artistic anatomy. You're now going to see lecture number two on the pelvis. Well, <clears throat> tonight we're going to take up the pelvis. This is the pelvis down here. <coughs> uh, the first problem, of course, in drawing is to be aware that the form exists. But most people seem to know that they have pelvises. Well, not everybody. Uh, I find it very strange, especially uh, sort of 15, 16 year old girls are the ones who don't know they have pelvises, of all people. Uh, the pelvis is made up of two bones, this one and that one, that are mirror opposites. Uh, very vaguely, they're the shape of a propeller. That is, the bottom is twisted that way and the top is twisted that way. Uh, they meet in the center at a great landmark we call the symphysis pubis, right here. Uh, they are joined together in the back by <coughs> uh, this uh, triangular uh, piece, which is called the sacrum. At the bottom of the sacrum is the human tail. It's called the coccyx, which means cuckoo's beak. Uh, this is actually made up of uh, five vertebrae that, are, that have been uh, fused together through evolution. If you know an individual vertebra, you can recognize these bumps on here. These are the dorsal spines. And uh, these bumps would be the transverse spines and so on. Uh, the great secret of the pelvis for artists is the recognition of the front and the rear triangle. Triangles. Uh, you see, these points here, which most artists call the pelvic points, they're undoubtedly the most important landmarks on the human body, I do believe. Uh, a trained artist draws eight lines to that point uh, very frequently. See, the great thing about landmarks is you drive your lines to them. If you know where they are, why, it's very easy to start your line on one and end it on another. Uh, that's perhaps why, why, when you're drawing the model here, you occasionally ought to throw in your landmarks front and back. Uh, the back triangle is, uh, frankly, this point here, which is the... Uh, well, of course, doctors, the trouble with the artist's vocabulary is it's not exact, and yet I try to use it as much as possible. Uh, the doctor calls this the superior anterior iliac spine what he calls it, and you may see that in a lot of the uh, artistic anatomy books. The artist calls it the pelvic point, each one of them. Uh, the doctor calls this the posterior superior iliac spine. Uh, the triangle you see on the back of the body is actually the points, uh, this uh, spine, you know that means protrusion of bone, this one, and where the buttocks come together about here just a little above the coccyx. It seems to be a very smooth plane by the time you get all the meat over it, you know. But uh, what I'm trying to point out is that an artist thinks of the pelvis in terms of the front triangle, which is this, and the back triangle. And he thinks of those two triangles as uh, moving equally, you might say. If one moves, the other has to move because the pelvis is a, is a solid mass, you know. And so he's very, very anxious to place the front and the back triangle. And as I intimated, the great trick is when you place the front one, place the back. Because then you learn to see through the body. Well, uh, I always feel that one has to learn the, uh, the about, a lot about the skull, about the uh, bony rib cage and the bony pelvis because they absolutely force the form uh, in their regions. 
and if possible, learn them more or less by heart, the way an artist, trained artist do. Uh, the pelvis can be quite easily learned if you put it in a block and relate it to the block, just the way you the rib cage can. Uh, the block you could make up yourself. I like to use the block of four five-eyed cubes for both the rib cage and the pelvis because it seems terribly convenient. So if we wanted to draw a uh, a uh, rib cage, we, we could just draw a square, really, and think of it as a block. <coughs> be about like that. And uh, last week, uh, we assembled a number of points. First of all, we thought of it as, as, uh, as four five-eyed cubes, you know, like that. And the pit of the neck was there, and the uh, circle of the first ribs was there. There was this uh, 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 great uh, sternum bone here, and uh, uh, there was a very important little process there, the ensiform process. And then we got various landmarks, the tip of the tenth rib. And so, and then we ran a line across there to find out where the rib cage would be widest on the front view. And we didn't have much trouble coming down, keeping within the box, and getting the feel of a rib cage. And we talked a little about this the edge of the cartilage. <clears throat> now, that's a real box, three-dimensional. It has uh, vertical line systems and lines parallel to those vertical line systems. It has width systems and it has depth systems which you have to imagine. We can make a pelvic box of exactly the same size uh, for a woman. Uh, for a man, we would have to make the pelvis as narrow as the rib cage, but all the same principles are used, so it's pretty easy. You see, there again are four uh, five-eyed cubes. Now we go off to landmarks. Uh, as I say, these are the most important, uh, the uh, pelvic points, which is a pole called the superior anterior iliac spines. I suppose that sounds like Greek to you, but it's probably Latin. Uh, we can put them here about one eye in on this line here. You put a point there. I'll make X's so you can see them. But if you're drawing, just put points. You often proceed down your page, you know, with, uh, with landmark points as you draw the figure. I suppose you ought to know what that all means. Superior, it's, no, it's anterior, that means in front. Superior means above, really means above this one. Uh, iliac, uh, this bone here has the terrible name of os synovenatum and is divided into three bones when you're young, but they all grow together when you're older, and the top one is called the ilium. This is the pubis here. This is the ischium. But those are doctor's matters. We try to get the shape of the bone as a whole. Uh, we try really to get our feeling of the pelvis through landmarks and then connect the landmarks with lines. Uh, if we just half this distance here, we get a, a landmark. That's the pubic symphysis. Symphysis comes from the Greek, means growing together. Uh, now, the thing is, these things are very big. That symphysis is as big as all of, the, well, the symphysis is the actual meeting, but this uh, bony projection of the pubis is, uh, is really very big here. It's about so big. And uh, even these pelvic points are about so big, you know, about as big as your finger. I'll have to get in front to see it out. Know, I think a little nearer. Uh, they're, they're quite big. So if we're using points, we decide where we put our point, you see. 
I know here I put it on the outside lower corner of the, uh, of the projection. Here I put it in the exact center of the top. You see, the great thing about points is construction points is that nobody's going to scold you because they mess up your picture. You won't even be able to scold yourself, and you may use them. If I try to persuade you to use construction lines, there's a very famous one. Runs right through those two points. I can't get any of my students to do that because they think it ruins their picture. But I can get them to use points. But uh, don't make that feel, don't that make you feel that construction lines are not important. They're of enormous importance in learning how to draw. They remain in your subconscious after you've learned. I find how you learn them, use them all the time, even in these lectures, subconsciously. Now, we have to learn the feel of the top of this bone, which is called the pelvic crest. Uh, for a great many reasons. In the first place, uh, the outer line is a contour line about the body. And, of course, the bone is responsible for the shape of the muscles that uh, fall to it and fall from it. You see, it's through the skeleton we uh, come to a decision as the shape of the uh, muscle masses we use. And that's a creative uh, act on the part of the individual artist, you know. Nobody knows what shape these things really are. Uh, you yourself have to decide on the shape. Naturally, you can't decide on the shape unless you know the darn thing exists. And no layman knows that the external oblique muscle is here, you know. But all trained artists do. So we have to learn the movement of the crest in order to, to get a feeling of the shape of the muscles. And it's nice to know the contour line because that gives you a feeling of the cross section of the body there. And that comes into light and shade problems, you know. Uh, what's more, an artist has to know that whenever the flesh falls over the pelvic crest, it changes angle. That means for a trained artist that the shade changes, shade values change. He may not be able to see them on the model, but he'll change them because he knows where the uh, flesh flows over the crest, you see, because he knows where the pelvic crest is. Uh, there's quite an interesting little drawing problem here. You know, we draw lines where planes meet. And if we're making a line drawing of this pelvis, and we wanted to draw the pelvic crest, we'd say, well, that's a plane looking out that way, and uh, this uh, seems to be a plane looking up this way, and they meet along this line here, which doesn't exist. Uh, they meet on that line, and that's the line we draw if we're drawing the uh, outer line of the pelvic crest. If we're drawing the inner line, we just stroke the, uh, the plane meeting that way, you see. Uh, that's why one of the reasons we draw lines is where planes meet. We also draw them where colors meet. Well, we'll go out to some other points. There's the wide point of the pelvis. It's here. <coughs> you see, then I went subconsciously across on my width system to get the other point. It's about one quarter this distance up here. There's then the high point of the pelvic crest, and uh, you can take the physical middle of this uh, five-eyed cube, if you wish. It's right there. Well, with any curve, if you can get two or three lines, you've got the curve. So I can draw the outer line of that thing without much trouble, you see, right down to the back triangle, which I haven't put in. Uh, it goes very abruptly down. And I get a feel of the crest as it appears on the outside of the body. Uh, the back triangle is uh, a triangle on the other, on the back there. And uh, it uh, goes as low as the uh, symphysis. And its great quality is it's one third the whole width of the pelvis in men and women. Uh, perhaps you can think of it as a triangle drawn on the inside of a sphere. You know, all these uh, planes we have uh, taken from the skins of uh, simple masses, you know. Uh, if it uh, is that, it's in there, it's pointing downward. And the artists have this rule of up planes light, down planes dark. Uh, this will take on more reality, of course. Uh, it'll be a stronger illusion if I darken that. Now, the back triangle and the front triangle are connected by a circle 
uh, called the inlet, which is of great interest to obstetricians. Here it is here. Of course, you can see it isn't a circle. Uh, it's appropriate. It looks more like a Valentine's heart. You see that? That's refinement. You see, we take the simple and we refine through life, uh, or try to. Uh, of course, we have to get we have to be careful about super refinement. You know, uh, that might lead to decadence, and we'll have more to say about decadence later. Uh, <laughs> Well, there is a nice ligament that runs from the pelvic point here to the symphysis. It's called Poupart's ligament, named after Dr. Jean Francois Poupart, who was the uh, physician of Madame de Maintenon, who was the mistress of Louis the Sixteenth. Yes, are there any historians here? Uh, and ended up as the director of a little girl's school. I've never thought that was quite right, but that's what she did. Uh, uh, that's called Poupart's ligament, though many doctors uh, hate the national feel of some of these names and will call it the inguinal ligament. Now, oh, another great point is what they call the tuberosity of the ischium, this thing here. Uh, I like to make my uh, constructional point on the lower left-hand corner of that thing. You know, it really looks like the back of the heel down there. Uh, there is a trick to get it, which is to run a vertical of the mass. This is the mass, you see, these are the verticals. The vertical of the mass to within about one eye above the bottom of the mass. And you get your point. And you can imagine the two, uh, the, uh, the two bras to the ischium back there. Uh, then you know, of course, the bone that goes back to it. Uh, now, <clears throat> an important part of the pelvis is this uh, hole for the leg bone which has a marvelous Latin name of acetabulum. That means little vinegar cup. Uh, <clears throat> the engineering of this body is extremely subtle. Uh, so subtle that in many ways it hasn't been worked out. It's far above the most subtle aeronautical engineering. But it's amazing how now and then you run into something so simple that anybody can understand it. This is a ball and socket joint. That means you can move the leg in any direction. Uh, so, of course, there is a nice ball there, you see, that fits into a nice uh, cup. And uh, the acetabulum can be caught by running a construction line from the wide point to the point of the ischium and putting the back lip of the acetabulum on that line. It's a little more than half this distance, not much. Now, uh, two more, or really one, two on each side. These points here. <coughs> uh, oh, artists call them, uh, the, uh, they, what do they call them? The lower pelvic uh, points very often. Uh, the doctors, of course, call them the, the anterior inferior iliac spine. You see, this is the anterior superior, and that's the anterior interior. Uh, they, uh, uh, they are about a little above the ball, about here, uh, behind Poupart's ligament. They're about there. Now, I tell you their great importance. Uh, perhaps you can all feel your pelvic points. You're all sitting down, and you find that your leg springs from the secondary point. You see? Whether you're standing or sitting. And artists like to know about that. Now, with those few points, you've got about what an artist knows about a pelvis. Uh, 
you can refine for the rest of your life if you wish and uh, oh you know you find there are movements here and there and uh, of not much importance there's an inner line here if you want to uh, uh, go after it uh, things of that sort uh, but the, uh, the, points, the points to me the uh, points identifying the landmarks are the great thing and if you can place them in their proper position uh, it's of tremendous help in drawing especially if you can put them on the model uh, on the, if we draw the side view of course we'll get uh, a conception of the whole and uh, so we'd find that uh, as you probably remember uh, that we uh, that we uh, use the same five-eyed cubes from the side point of view <coughs> get our distance about that And you remember the pit of the neck was there, we're going to do the rib cage, and there's the uh, circle of the first ribs, and then the sternum went that way, dropped vertically on the ensiform, and then it continued to bulge way out, uh, it continued to bulge out on the cartilage, uh, and then at about the eighth rib went violently back. Uh, the right outline here would touch here, I go back a little there, yeah. Touch there and come down, go about to the halfway point. You have a skeletal rib cage on the profile. <coughs> See how differently it bulges from the front view. Now, on the side view of the pelvis here, this uh, important pelvic point is here. Or we might say this one was here. The other one is through the board. <coughs> they are both on a width line. But a line on end looks like a point. So all those ideas are, uh, are coinciding there, you see. Uh, the symphysis pubis is on this front plane here, about here. Uh, the back triangle uh, curves because it's a uh, it's a spherical triangle and uh, I suppose if we thought of the sacrum it would move this way and you see end there it's quite thick really the sacrum uh, this is the famous depth line of the pelvis it's very hard to find anatomical depth lines on, this, on the figure. But you see, this, this works. Just as this is the famous width line of the pelvis. The height line is automatic. It's the, uh, the center uh, vertical. Now, we get our crest. The wide point is there. That's that. The high point is the physical center of the block. So we just run the outside line along here. Uh, there's a point that medical books never mention. It's that little angle there. Uh, artists call it the re-entering angle. <coughs> uh, oh, we come down here, you see, and we get the uh, secondary point. We move to the symphysis. You remember how we dropped a vertical to get the back of the ischium? See? From the high point? And as I say, it looks good here like the back of a human uh, skeletal heel. Uh, now we can play this trick. From the wide point to the point of the ischium. And we know that the back lip of the acetabulum will lie on there, you see. Well, uh, here is the uh, 
posterior superior iliac spine. And then if you want a little refinement, you just study your pelvis for a few years and uh, get that sort of thing. Uh, there's a nice hole in the, uh, in the pelvis here, I guess just to make it lighter. You get the side view of the pelvis, which is quite hard to draw. Um, uh, if you start drawing it, if you don't box it up, you'll make it about so wide. I don't know why everybody does. Well, I think we might just have time to draw a back view. Uh, but then, if you've learnt the front view, uh, certainly the back view shouldn't be any trouble, because it's really, for an artist, just the same thing. Uh, <coughs> You see, there's our pelvic box down below. Uh, the, uh, the center line is a good construction line, and so are the uh, central lines here. <coughs> uh, the uh, pit of the neck is there. So the circle, we'd see this way. Uh, really, it's the same to me as the front view. I think artists feel that way. Uh, and yet, uh, unless I could see through, as all artists can, and see that ensiform cartilage, how would I know where that was widest, you see, on the back view? Well, I didn't quite hit it either, did I? <coughs> well, that's enough uh, ribcage for the present. Uh, the back triangle would be one-third of that line, you see, about that. And we go down about halfway. The high point, we know where that is. Right in the physical middle of that five-eyed cube. The wide point. So we get a pretty good pelvic crest right away. <coughs> uh, we won't see the front point because it's hidden there. Uh, the back of the ischium must be about here. The point is there, you see. It's just like a heel. Uh, can you feel the front triangle even though you're at the back? Feel the symphysis pubis there? I suppose when I think of the symphysis pubis, I know that what it really means is this um, joining together here. But I think of this whole protrusion of the pubic bones, which anybody can feel on themselves if they wish, because a great way to learn anatomy is to feel yourself all the time and come to a conclusion as to where these things are. Uh, there's one thing in particular when you draw the arm. You have to know where these condyles are, these bumps here, you see. Otherwise, you don't know how much the upper arm has rotated. Uh, frequently, the model puts her arm in some peculiar position. The thing to do is put your arm in that position. Just feel yourself. You can feel them. They are uh, very, very uh, uh, obvious when you feel them. In many ways, your eyes much better, for, I mean, your fingers much better for shape, you know, than your eyes. Uh, well, we put in almost all our points. We didn't put in this circle, this inlet, but we can imagine it uh, going in there and going to the symphysis pubis, you know. Uh, let's get this, uh, this construction line. It has another value, too. It sort of holds in the pelvis. You know the pelvis will never be any wider than that. From the wide point to the point of the ischium, you see. <coughs> uh, and then all this business you learn as time goes on. Oh, I suppose we could put in the, uh, the back lip of the acetabulum and be touching that construction line, you see. <coughs> uh, this sort of cutting in here, you learn as time goes on. And, and certainly you can feel these. Uh, <coughs> the students have a funny name for these things, pelvis. Uh, they call those the wheels. 
Now oh, that's not bad, you know. It has a little more shape than the doctor's names. Uh, you have to realize that you're all sitting on these bones right now. Uh, that gluteus maximus, the great big buttocks muscle, when you put your leg up, it slips aside from those bones. That's what you sit on. And that's what your dog sits on, or your cow, if you happen to have them. Uh, it, uh, I don't know how many of you have these vast farms up in Connecticut, but I guess a good many. But go out and look at your cows tomorrow morning and look at the ischium coming through. Here. Be very clear. And then look at the transverse uh, processes here on the uh, cow. The leather sort of hangs from them, you know, on a cow. You can, and you can see these clearly on many dogs. You can feel them on your cat. It's pretty hard to feel ours when we're standing up because the great gluteal muscle is over them. Uh, but if you should feel under your uh, seat now, you could feel them all right. Uh, they're right there. That's what you're sitting on. Uh, well, as I say, you learn a detail or so, and uh, pretty soon you have a pelvis from the back. Now I think our problem might be to study the muscles that run from the rib cage to the pelvis. Uh, first of all, to learn that they exist, and second, perhaps, to come to a shape conception, and later on, uh, perhaps decide on their proportions, and then a little later decide on where they are, and later on decide what happens when light hits these shapes we thought of. You see, that's all it is, simple matter. Uh, there is, you see, between the rib cage and the pelvis, this great mass of meat here that the artists call the external oblique muscle. The doctors, in their quaint way, call it oblicus externus. Uh, uh, frankly, it's a muscle group. Uh, there are a couple of very much the same muscles underneath it that go to the pelvic crest from the rib cage. Uh, but we think of the outer muscle, of course, and label it as such. And uh, we want to get the character and the shape of that thing on each side. Uh, first of all, we ought to know what it does. Uh, you know that uh, muscles and muscle groups are all antagonistic, like bad married couples. They all uh, pull against each other. Uh, I have an external oblique here, running from the rib cage to the pelvis, and one on the other side. If this one pulls, it pulls me this way. This one pulls, pulls me that way. Uh, it's called the external oblique because the fi fibers run obliquely this way. Uh, that gives it another function. It can rotate my rib cage on the pelvis. Uh, I ought to study the direction of fibers for a great number of reasons. Uh, one of them is that you know shade lines Sometimes you just don't know which way to run them. You run out of ideas. And frequently, if you just follow the muscle fibers, they look very well. That's particularly true of the external oblique for some reason. Uh, well, we know the shapes of the bones from which the external oblique falls, that is, the ribs there. We know the shape of the pelvic crest after a little study. That should give us some conception of the external oblique. Uh, we know its function. Uh, among other things, it's a rotator. Uh, all muscles in the body that rotate anything, with a couple of exceptions, uh, 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 become a spiral in nature. This uh, beautiful sternomastoid that all students know, and always exaggerate, I may say. Uh, there is a lesson there, you know. The neck is a simple cylinder. The sternomastoid is a detail. They draw this muscle so strongly that you can hardly see the neck. They get so fond of it. But you can see it spiraling around the cylinder of the neck. Uh, the supinator mass here spirals around the arm. Sartorius spirals around the lower thigh. And all these muscles that rotate have a spiral quality. Uh, so if I draw this external oblique, uh, I'll certainly think spiral as I draw it, you know. Uh, I just think it, and it'll look just a touch different. Of course, I've spent a great part of my life during my training in studying spirals by drawing cylinders and learning to throw spirals around cylinders, you see, and around the other side, too. 
It's the way you learn to draw spirals. It's the way you draw spiral ribbons, you see. That's the way Botticelli drew that beautiful spiral hair on the Virgin. I don't mean the Virgin at all. I mean Venus. Great difference. Uh, uh, Mr. Clownis has on his desk downstairs a uh, ashtray and made by the Japanese, incidentally, and on it is Botticelli's Venus. Uh, well, uh, Botticelli to me is perhaps the best hairdresser that ever existed. He made it all up and quite a bit of it is that. <laughs> Spiral curls, you know. Uh, this muscle fall, uh, follows the pelvic crest, and uh, for the moment we might think of it as a form like uh, a teardrop in front. <coughs> And yet, we have to have all kinds of shape conceptions. Uh, perhaps you might take a, uh, a cone. Uh, take a cone, and running a horizontal around the top of the cone, uh, let it fall, and then run a downhill line around the bottom, and feel a bit of the other side, you get a little feel of the surface of that. Uh, artists frequently, when they're dealing with uh, light, uh, like to block up the external oblique uh, mass. And that's best shown on the side view. Uh, they frequently like to think of it this way. It has a back plane for them. It has a strong front plane. And it has a plane looking at you. It's very important to remember that the back plane of the oblique is a down plane and takes shade. And the front plane, which is that, uh, is, a, uh, is a very light plane. Not the one I'm shading, but that there in the front. Uh, that has a great effect on light if the light is coming from above, you know. Uh, So you go to work on a shape conception of the external oblique and come up with your own because you're all individual artists and you have to have your individual styles and many of these styles will depend a great deal on your secret landmarks and the shapes that you decide on for the various uh, masses of the body you know. Now, there's a great muscle in front here that runs from the rib cage to the symphysis pubis that I think most of you are familiar with. It's called the uh, straight muscle of the abdomen or rectus abdominis. Uh, it's very obvious what it does. It goes in the rib cage here, the symphysis there, and makes you bow, you see, pulls you forward. Uh, working against it, of course, uh, those strong cords I told you about last week, these great uh, muscles in the back from the ribcage to the pelvis, you see. Uh, they're the ant antagonistic muscles to rectus abdominis in the front. Uh, rectus abdominis uh, again shows the importance of this ensiform cartilage as a landmark, especially the bottom. Because as you can see by looking at the man, uh, it comes in three pieces with a line down the center. First piece goes about to the top of the fifth rib, and the second about half down here. They get a little narrow as they come down, and then it goes right down to the symphysis pubis. <coughs> we'll rub out everything behind so you can see it. 
Uh, it has an incise line down the center, you know, that reaches just as far as the navel, which is officially uh, here. You see the fibers of this muscle all running this way. And then they meet a little sheet of uh, tendon, you might say, and they start again. And then they go all the way down to here. Uh, there's your navel right there where it should be. Well, there it is. What's its shape? You see, that's your second question. Now you know it exists. What's its shape? <coughs> this being Valentine's Day, they tell me. Though none of them told me by mail, I noticed this morning. But, uh, you know, there are cards with little uh, ships on them. Uh, sort of full rigged ships. And uh, I guess we can put one here. Uh, you have a little ship like this. I suppose it look old fashioned. And uh, they have a mast. You see, and they have sails on them. They seem to be tied to the mast. It's about the shape of that darn thing. What would light do with that? Lights of your own choosing. How much... Uh, do you look at lights when you go to the yacht races and that sort of thing? How much do you watch the shade movement on your sails when you're sailing that beautiful yacht of yours? That, uh, that's what we have to do in learning about shade. We have to see what shade does to white surfaces all the time. As you get trained, you can see the shade movements on colored surfaces. It's much easier to uh, see them on white surfaces. Well, I mean, you... Uh, you girls here, when your maid, that little French maid of yours, brings you your chocolate in the morning, uh, look at a white apron as the light from the window falls on it and see what happens to the movement of the shade. And that sort of thing will uh, get you right into shade movement, which is so important in drawing, uh, which I can't take up here because they make me give lectures on anatomy. Uh, one of the great things about studying traditional art is the sensitivity you get from the movement of values, you know. Remember, they always move in two directions at once. Uh, well, this uh, rectus abdominis is joined to the rib cage by some fibers that never seem to me of much importance in drawing, and is solidly joined down here to the symphysis. Uh, this muscle here, uh, the external oblique, turns into what we call a ponderosis, which is flat tendon, you see, through here, all through here. That's a ponderosis. Uh, the ponderosis then divides and goes over the front of the rectus abdominis, and another part goes over the back, so that rectus abdominis moves in, an upon a, in, a, sheet, in a sheath of a ponderosis, like a sword in a scabbard. <coughs> uh, some of you may possibly know about hernias. You know hernia is when a part of the intestine breaks through the, uh, the front of the body or the back. Of course, this is where it's liable to break through. That's where the doctor would first look, you see, for a hernia, because uh, that's weak. Uh, this is all muscular and strong. Uh, there's a place in the back here. We'll have to uh, go ahead a bit, but some of you know this great muscle comes down here. Uh, uh, latissimus dorsi. Uh, we ought to put the, the oblique in the back anyway. You see how those two uh, insertions related to the high point? If you know that, you can get the insertion. Uh, uh, there's the external oblique from the back. It's a down plane, of course. We ought to darken it. That's where you love to get a hernia in the back. You see, because there's no muscular wall there. Uh, 
Uh, in the back here, we discussed, I believe, last time, though I may be mistaken, this great line here and how important it was. It's called the line of the angle of the ribs. And uh, frankly, we bring it down from the ball on the top of the head when we get going. You know, we feel this beautiful long line there. Uh, its great value, uh, one of its great values is that it, uh, it shows the width of these strong cords that support the body, support the rib cage uh, in the small of the back here and up there. It, they die out very much here. Uh, so in this district, uh, we'd, uh, we'd feel those cords very strongly. Uh, another advantage of the line of the angle of the ribs is it shows us the first movement of the pelvic crest up to there till it hits the re-entering angle when it flies off to the high point, you see. So if we drew a counter line around there, we'd, we got a feeling of how uh, powerful those very human uh, uh, muscles are that hold, us, hold our rib cage erect and make us into human beings. The other oblique is over there. See that counter line? Uh, maybe now when you draw a belt, when you draw a belt, you'd, uh, you might feel that counter line a bit as it comes around the body. See it go over the oblique, over the belly, over the other oblique. There isn't any oblique in this picture, but it's perfect cinch to put it in because we know where it starts and where it ends. Uh, you see, we know it starts at the bottom of the ensiform cartilage, and we know it has to end there. Uh, that's about all we know because you know some people are like this and some are like this and you know but they all have to start here I suppose fairly healthy young person would go along sort of like that you see uh, but there are some people uh, I suppose it all depends what they've been up to uh, <laughs> might go that way but you see how that line has to get back to the landmark and how that one does too doesn't matter how fat they are or what they've been up to really doesn't. It has to start at one landmark and end at another. That's what lands, lines do if you can grasp the landmarks. Uh, the strong cords at the back, of course, would be here. Uh, I think the reason I'm throwing the counter line around is to remind people that when they draw belts, they have a great chance to tell about the form of that region. Uh, uh, belts always hold in the flesh between the rib cage and the pelvis, you see. And if you give them just a hint of the counter line, as if you're drawing them a bit from above or a little below, they're much better than the straight line that the beginner makes. I think it's time for a little recess, uh, and we'll be back and we'll go a little into the thigh down here. Now, I must tell you that the layman's conception of the skeleton is very odd indeed. Uh, but there's one thing that he does do, and that is he thinks of all the long bones of the body, these here, you see, as a rod with something on the top and something on the bottom. But, of course, something is a word. So if you ask him to draw a long bone, he'll do something like that. He knows that a rod, you see, then he puts something on the top and he puts something on the bottom, you see. These somethings they draw look a good deal like Brussels sprouts. Uh, it's great fun looking at the, the uh, flags of 17th century pirates, who of course were laymen in regard to art. They had a skull and crossbones, you know, to frighten people. And they do exactly what all your beginners do. Uh, the, uh, the skull uh, it's usually like this, with the eyes way up here. Every beginner does that, you know. The eyes are halfway down the head. Uh, then they put crossbones, uh, which are long bones, and they put something on one end, they put something on the bottom, you see. Because they never had the advantage of going to the art student's leave or <laughs> the Slade school. That's the way they draw them. Uh, if they draw the side view of a skull, they do just what all your beginners do, they cut off the back. And they put the eye up there. Uh, well, the eye's halfway down, and the back sticks out just as far as this here, in most cases, you know. 
fact, the, that measurement, those two measurements together are very famous among anthropologists, called the head index. Uh, and everybody is a little more one way, a little more the other way, uh, pretty much according to race, you know. They're either brachiocephalic or dolichocephalic, as they say, the anthropologists. A little anthropology helps you in drawing, you know. Uh, maybe not too much, but a little. <laughs> well, uh, we want to draw this bone here. As artists, what do we do? Uh, this is pretty much a barrage, you can tell it by feeling, but what's on top? Well, what we do as artists is to go and look and see, you see, like that. And we look at it from every possible point of view. Uh, that's why the reality, the real bone's much better than a picture. And we look to see what shapes are at the top. Uh, in the beginning, we can think of them very simply. Uh, we deal with a ball and socket joint, so there must be a ball going into the socket, you see, on the top. And then uh, there's what they call a neck here, which is close to a cylinder. And then there's a uh, kind of a box-like business, which we can turn at once into a cube if we wish. And uh, that's much better, you see, as an idea than, than a something. In other words, don't draw words, draw shapes. Uh, now you can refine that the rest of your life. Uh, frankly, you don't have to very much. The whole thing is hidden in the flesh, and that arrangement I've just drawn expresses the uh, complete function, as we'll see. Uh, uh, this box here is a great landmark. It's called the Great Trochanter. It uh, used a lot by artists, and a number of lines go to it. It comes through the skin right on this surface, you see. Uh, the rod then falls. Rod falls. I better draw it over here. <coughs> you see, we have a ball. <coughs> a ball and a... Uh, neck, as they call it, on that box there. <coughs> and the rod falls inward, of course, uh, and plunges into uh, something. But what shape is it, you see? That's where the artist comes in. And so the artist looks to see, you see? He looks to see, maybe even feels. And he comes to a decision, his own decision, is what shape this rod goes into. Uh, in the beginning, he turns to his mass conceptions, and among them is the spool. Uh, so he's pretty safe if he draws a spool down here. Except, a spool, these things have to be refined, and the spool has to be refined right away. It's not quite like the spool you find in your mother's sewing basket, if she still happens to have one. This plane looks out this way, and that plane looks out that way. Uh, that gives you a big truth about the knee. The knee is narrow in front and wide behind. As a matter of fact, you ought to go through your whole body and find out where you're narrow in front and wide behind. Or where you're wide in front and narrow behind, you see. That's why artists say you ought to know, one of the reasons they say you ought to know the cross section of the body from the top of the head to the ground. Because you can learn it very easily while you're practicing your figure drawing by running count all lines around the body horizontally. You can learn every cross section there is, and of course those cross sections are related directly to light and shade. That's why it's a great thing to run count all lines over your body as you draw, or after you've drawn, if you wish. So, we can take the femur in any one of these poses, let's take it to the front, and we can put the ball in the socket, bring out the neck, and get the great trochanter, which we find comes through our confining box. Now, there's a curious thing about this body that uh, if we double the shoulder blade, we get this arm bone. If we double the pelvis, we get the length of the, uh, we get the length of the uh, uh, femur. <coughs> In other words, there was a time when these girdles were exactly the same, you know. Two pelvic lengths make a good-sized femur. So, uh, another thing I know is it'd be three five-eyed lines uh, would do it too. But we'd take a pelvic height, 
and uh, we'll feel the ground is about here. I don't mean the ground, I mean the knee. Uh, skeletons, of course, are not kneed, so the bone would have to come down this way. And the spool would be on the, mid on the bottom here, not quite touching the center line. But how wide would it be is a good question, because that has a lot to do with proportion. If there's one thing beginners do is to make feet about so big and the rest of the body about so big. And the only way you can hold yourself down is hold yourself down mentally. Uh, there's a very nice uh, equality here. The distance across the back of the knee is the same as the widest part of the foot here. Uh, the strange thing is that applies to the hand too. Uh, the distance across the condyles is the same as the distance across the back of the hand, or pretty close. Uh, now, the distance across here is about half the width of the head, or half of a five-eyed line, if you wish. Uh, you see, when you draw, you keep have to glance back, as far as proportions go. You have to glance back all the time and relate what you're drawing to everything else, you see, so that everything will be in beautiful proportion. Of course, uh, uh, this spool here rests on the top of a long bone. Uh, what's the shape of that thing? The bone is called the tibia. Uh, what is its shape? It's your responsibility to find out and to come to a conclusion. Uh, well, of course, the way to find out is to look at it, you see, and feel it and come to a decision. Uh, it's really, uh, the closest you can think is that it's like half a cylinder, a rather shallow cylinder. Uh, we'll take it up later on in detail. Well, we can put the bone in all these pictures. It would, uh, the ball would go in the socket and the neck would come out. The great trochanter would be about here. <coughs> Uh, there's a beautiful construction line in drawing, and that is the back of this thing here. It's a plane, really, coming at you. And you'll find that the, uh, the bone will fall with a gracious curve that reflects the front of the thigh, of course, uh, about two pelvic lengths. <coughs> the bone will fall and plunge into the spool, and we see the spool from the side. And the spool from the side is like that. And the back of the spool would touch that construction plane. Uh, in other words, the spool from the side is longer this way than it is that way. Uh, think what that means when you bend your knee. It makes your knee sort of high in feeling, you see. Now, oh, the back view is the same as the front, really. See, the bone fits in the socket, the great trochanter comes out. The bone falls uh, to the center line. Where's the floor here, or the knee? The bone falls to the center line. And we see the back of the spool, and that, that brings a new conception in. The back of the spool is like two uh, knobs. And that sits on the platform of the bone below, the tibia. There's another bone down here we'll find out the fibula, or needle bone, because it pierces the flesh. Just as the two bones here, there are two bones there. Because you see, when we came out of the sea, our shoulder girdle with the four limbs and our pelvic girdle with the rear limbs are very much the same. And we came out this way, you see. You know lizards, they crawl this way. They haven't come out very recently. Uh, and then our knees got twisted, uh, arm, our elbows got twisted to the back and our knees got twisted to the forward, you see. But as we get on, we'll find there are a great many analogies between uh, forms here and forms up here. Now, we come into function. And they like to say that function makes form. Uh, how, may we might ask, uh, do you move this bone out that way? That motion is called abduction by doctors. 
It means moving away from home, being kidnapped, abduction. Uh, it's done by a muscle called gluteus medius, the middle-sized gluteal muscle, that runs from the pelvic crest, <clears throat> from the pelvic crest to the great trochanter. A muscle like that, you see. You see the front line of it coming off the pelvic point I made? Fibers go that way. It doesn't look much like much in that picture, but let's see how enormous it is on the side picture. It's one of the great masses of the body, gluteus medius. Where's the top of the trochanter? It's that muscle there. Gluteus medius, middle, uh, medium-sized gluteal muscle. Uh, the fibers, you see, run this way. When they pull, naturally you do that. Now you begin to see why the celestial engineers put a neck there so that that muscle could get leverage and pull your leg out, you see. The shape, of course, is enormously uh, influenced by the pelvic crest. <coughs> the muscle as a whole has some of the qualities of a spherical triangle in shape. Well, you can't leave your leg out there for years. You've got to get it back. How do you get it back? Uh, how do you adduct it, as the doctors would say? You'll find that that's done by a group of five muscles called the adductor muscles. And you run into a nice principle in anatomy. And that is that if two or more muscles have approximately the same function, the artist can group them together and hardly bother with the details of the individual muscles. If two or more muscles have the same function, artists group them together as one mass. And the leg is pulled in by the adductor muscles. And now, there are five on this front view, and they come from the uh, front of the pelvis, uh, from the front of the pelvis, and from the, uh, uh, th this line here, the pubis and the ischium. Uh, there are five all together, so you can see that the, the movement of the uh, uh, bottom of the pelvis is going to control the shape of the inside of your thigh here. And they all sweep down, and they go into a line in the back of the bone. Now, unless you're quite ambitious, you really don't have to study them very much and learn their individual and terrible names, like Dr. Magnus, Pectineus, and I don't know what else, Dr. Brevis, because the artist always takes that mass and just thinks of it as a sort of a football-shaped mass there, and he calls it the adductor group. And he knows that the mass, or group, is antagonistic to gluteus medius. And he knows that's the way you move your leg this way and that way, you see. Uh, I suppose on this view, we had a gluteus medius is pretty big on the back of the body. Goes all the way to the end of the uh, pelvic crest here. No, not quite. <coughs> you see, it becomes that mass there. Uh, the adductor mass would be the same as the front view. <coughs> It hit the center line there and then just move into the body, fade away. Uh, we could see the muscles growing into the back line there if we look now. They'd all be growing into the back line. That's the adductor group. Uh, now let's think what other things we have to do. Uh, we have to climb hills and go forward and get ahead in life, you know. Uh, we have to uh, uh, do that sort of thing. Uh, that's done by uh, the two muscles, actually, one of which you know. Uh, one is a muscle group. I'll have to put the uh, bone on the bottom here, the tibia with the fibula, in order to draw it. But the... Uh, leg is pulled backward to a great extent by what is called the hamstring group. There are a group of uh, muscles in the back, three really, 
in back here. They look like two, but there's one underneath there that are called the hamstring muscles. And the leg is pulled back largely by the hamstring group. And where do they start? Why, of course, at a landmark, the point of the ischium. And they come out like another football here, you see, the three of them. They, uh, one of them grows in the bone there, and they have on the outside here a very strong vertical cord, which is the official outer hamstring. And of course, if that muscle pulls, uh, I would pull the leg back. Uh, it might be interesting to note here that you can't pull the leg back of the vertical. Uh, because there's a little uh, ligament that runs from this secondary point to the great trochanter. And you can put your leg forward without disturbing the pelvis. But if you put it back beyond the vertical, that ligament takes hold and rotates the pelvis. You have to watch that in figure drawing. Because the model can move her leg forward with no movement of the pelvis at all. But the minute she puts it beyond the vertical, the whole pelvis rotates and every darn landmark on it, you see. And you have to watch for that. Uh, that would be called the iliofemoral ligament. Uh, another thing about it is it's a touch shorter in women than it is in men. And that means that a woman's pelvis is very slightly rotated to the uh, front that way. Uh, that means in order to uh, compensate uh, against the line of gravity, her rib cage has to be tilted a little more this way, you see. Uh, so I suppose in this, in this block, if it was a female block, you'd have to tilt the block just a little. Though a woman could easily hold a pelvis vertically if she wished. Uh, I really didn't bring out, I'll have to do it in other lectures, that uh, what I've drawn here is a female pelvis. Uh, if you draw a male pelvis, you have to be sure it's no wider than the widest point of the rib cage. Uh, all the little rules I've given you seem to hold, uh, though you just push, pull the widths in the bit if you do a, 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 a male. Uh, that, that's why in the back here, <coughs> a male pelvis, this thing looks much longer, but it really isn't longer, it's just narrower, because it still has to be one-third the width of his pelvis, you see. But the proportions are very much the same, except that the uh, male pelvis is usually no wider than his rib cage. Well, <coughs> to further pull the leg back, because it's so important for us to stride ahead, we have the great muscle gluteus maximus, which we discussed uh, last time, it seems to me. And here we notice that the bottom of the block we drew is the bottom of the buttocks, you see. The buttocks protrude outside of the block and go in about one-third down the bone. The muscles are good here like that. Fibers, of course, run this way. Uh, it's very important to realize it goes down the bone quite a lot. Uh, most beginners will end the muscle at the same level as the symphysis. All primitives do that, even in primitive uh, arts. The, of uh, <coughs> notable primitive art, they'll do it, like the Egyptians. Uh, you remember the Egyptian figures, the, uh, the head probably be profiled. What the Egyptians like was to draw the most characteristic view, you know. The head might well be profiled, uh, but the eye would be front face. You see, they had different ideas from ours. Uh, they would then come down and give you a, a front view of the torso. With a breast here and a breast here. But then they'd come down, they'd give you a side view of the pelvis. And they'd give you that view, which of course is wrong. Because we know now that the belly has to go into the symphysis. And gluteus maximus, in order to get leverage, has to go quite far down this bone in order to pull it back, you see. Well, those Egyptians, they'd go on, they'd give you a side view of the leg, and uh, then they'd give you a side view of the foot, 
but because they thought that the big toe side was much more characteristic of the, of the foot, they would put the big toe on the outside. Not in all Egyptian periods, but in certain ones. They do the same thing with the hand. If, if this, uh, this character has an Egyptian hand here, uh, uh, she would give you, even though it was this way, they'd put the thumb on this side. Because their idea was to make everything as characteristic as it could be, you see. Very good idea, too. Uh, if you can make these muscles more characteristic of themselves than they are, you'll be a beautiful draftsman by thinking of all their human qualities and their functional qualities and the shape of the bone from whence they come. Now, of course, we have to pull this bone forward. And that's done by a group of four muscles called the quadriceps. That means four heads. Uh, we think of them as one group. Uh, those muscles all come down. They all come down the front of the leg here and they go into the patella. And the patella has a strap and it goes into the kneeling point, we call it. Uh, that great group of muscles will not only pull your leg forward, but it will bend the lower leg for you. You see, uh, the, the muscles are very subtle. They may have uh, double functions, especially if they pass over two joints. Just the way this uh, hamstring. The hamstring will bend the lower leg, but the one I'm going to draw will pull it forward and also pull the thigh forward. The one I'm going to draw is called the quadriceps. <coughs> of course, I know where it starts, I know where it ends, no trouble for me. Uh, it starts, as I pointed out a moment ago, it starts at the secondary point. Uh, it goes towards the patella. Uh, most of you probably know what a patella is. It's a little, uh, we have one here. It's a, uh, well, that's curious history. Uh, it's called a sesamoid bone. You have many in your body, but they're very small. Uh, they seem to uh, uh, start as a deposit of calcium in some tendon that crosses over a joint. But the patella is called the prince of the sesamoids. It's the very biggest of all and very obvious. And uh, the, whole, uh, the whole quadricep group comes down and goes into it. And you see, if I pull on this patella, I'll straighten out the leg. Well, that's what your quadriceps does, uh, among its other functions. So it's very easy for me to draw on the side view. I just put my pencil on the landmark and go to the top of the patella, which is another landmark, you see. It's just this. Now, the back of the quadriceps group is a famous line, and we'll see why. The back of the quadriceps group is a beautiful spiral line that starts at the great trochanter here and spirals around towards the patella. I think that as I said last week, I, I believe I said, uh, a layman are perfectly amazed at the way an artist can put lines in the body, which they can't see very often. And yet it makes the body look more human. And that line is called the line between the functions. You see, this is the quadriceps group. And this is the hamstring group. This is made up of four muscles. That's made up of three. And that's the line between the functional groups. It's a line we very often draw on the thigh in, uh, uh, rather than any other we may see. Because it seems to be very expressive of the function of the thigh. Uh, the, uh, I'm just going to give you the great basic masses of the thigh tonight. We'll put on the <coughs> frosting next time, you know. Oh, incidentally, next time is Washington's birthday. So there's no meeting this class a week from now, or this lecture. It'll have to be two weeks from now that we really go into the individual muscles of the thigh. Uh, in the front here, we think of the patella uh, sitting about here with its uh, strap, you see, going down. And uh, the outside line of the quadriceps would start at the great trochanter and uh, go towards the patella. 
uh, the inside line to start at that secondary point and come down and, and sort of slop way over the patella. Because if there's one thing true about the knee, it's that all the muscles on the inside are very low and sloppy. Well, not sloppy, very low. Uh, you remember this hamstring group here? Uh, this hamstring group. Uh, from the back, it's really like a great football shape that comes off our point, you see, the ischium, and it bellies out, and it has on each side a hamstring. Uh, the outer one is very vertical and very straight, but the inner one is a big, uh, big, heavy rope that students call the spiral mass. And it comes down here, and it spirals around the leg to the front. Like that. Now, that's the hamstring. Uh, but what is this? Uh, where am I drawing that line to? I can see the through and see the patella through there. That's the quadriceps, you see. Uh, the line between the functions. Oh, we didn't put in the big buttocks here. You see the big buttocks comes off the uh, sacrum, goes over the hamstring into the bone, like that. And then the uh, quadriceps would spiral around to the front. Uh, Perhaps you're getting the secret of the knee right now. The secret of the knee is this. It's a good feeling for the bones with the understanding that the quadriceps group falls like a waterfall over the front and the hamstring group comes down the back. Uh, you see on this view here, uh, we have the quadriceps group, we have the adductor group, but there's no mention of the hamstring, but here comes the outer hamstring, you see, which is certainly part of the knee going into the fibula. And on the inside here comes this enormous spiral hamstring that goes in very low to the tibia underneath. Uh, there's the beginning of your knowledge about knees. Uh, you know, beginners uh, draw knees like this, as I've said. They'd put a thigh and then they'd do that, and they do that. And they're drawing the word. But the knee is a mass of details, a kind of a suitcase word. Lots of things in it, like the patella, the inner and outer hamstring, the shape of the bone, don't you see? That's what a knee really is. And you learn those individual shapes, you get beautiful knees. Uh, frankly, uh, people usually draw on their models a straightforward anatomical knee, because after you get to be 22 or 3, your knees go to pieces as far as looks go, and they just become a mass of wrinkles look a little like a map of the Bronx or something rather than a knee. <laughs> and uh, people are very liable to uh, make a knee much clearer than it is. Well, time is sweeping on, isn't it? Uh, I suppose that, uh, like last time, we ought to talk something about, say something about art in general. So I thought I might just give you a very short piece of poetry by Rudyard Kipling whose father, strangely enough, was not only an art teacher, but a very good painter and a museum curator all at once. Uh, <coughs> uh, this poem goes, uh, When Earth's last picture is painted and the tubes are twisted and dried, the oldest colors have faded and the youngest critics have died, we shall rest and faith we shall need it. Lie down for an eon or two till the master of all good workmen shall bid us to work anew. And those that were good shall be happy. They shall sit in a golden chair and splash at a ten-league canvas with brushes of comet's hair. They shall have real saints to draw from, Magdalene, Peter, and Paul. They shall work for an age at a sitting and never grow tired at all. And only the master shall praise them, and only the master shall blame, and no one shall work for money, 
and no one shall work for fame, but each for the joy of working, and each in his separate star shall draw the thing as he sees it for the God of things as they are. Thank you. You've just seen Robert Beverly Hale's lecture number two on the pelvis, one of his series of 10 lectures on figure drawing and artistic anatomy. We hope you'll join us for the next lecture in the series, lecture number three on the leg. This is Don Holden at the Art Students League of New York.